so you have friends in the audience who are going to heckle you. Anyway. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our award-winning We Need to Talk series on structural racism. This program is sponsored by the UNLV University Libraries and the Greenspun College of Urban Affairs. I'm your host, Clay T. White, the director of the Oral History Research Center. Today, we turn our Is, the ex is expansive in geography from its original neighborhood east of Las Vegas Boulevard, was historically the center of our center's diverse Latinx communities. As the city has grown, its significance as a cultural center has not diminished. Our panel today is discussing the history of the East Side, the cultural and financial investments underway that will celebrate the entire area and other topics as we go through this. If you're watching remotely, you can email your questions to university.libraries at unlv.edu. We'll answer those questions later on in the program. So joining me today, are Natalie Martinez. She is a UNLV graduate. She is a former member of our wonderful project, Latinx Voices, and she was one of our student historians. Next, we have Serafin Calvo. He is from the Community Services Division and the Engagement Office in North Las Vegas. Jose Contreras is with the City of Las Vegas the Office of University uh, Community Services. And we have Yvette. <laughs> she is a licensed social worker and instructor in our UNLV School of Social Work. So we're gonna get started by allowing Natalie to talk about the history of the East Side. We're gonna give her just a few minutes to do this. Natalie could talk about this all day, so please. Um, thank you so much, and thank you for having me today. <laughs> Feedback is away. Okay. Um, to get to the east side, the best way I like to think about the history of the east side is taking you a little bit further back. So I'm be very quick, I promise I'll be as brief as I can be, um, to talk about the immigration of the Latinx community here, and that really helps put a more better framework on what the east side is today. Um, so if we go back all the way to the 1500s, we're taken to uh, 1521 when we had majority of the Spanish rule. But I also want to recognize that before that and recognize now that we do are still standing on um, indigenous land. And so before that, before the Spanish rule, it was indigenous people that were here in about 1200 BC and that's indigenous people in North and Central Americas. And all of that was, all of those peoples were here living, cohabitating in what we have the Southwest region. Um, then in 1521, the Spanish came and had some ruling here in this general, in the Southwest region here. And then in 1821, Mexico came over to t find their independence. And then furthermore, we're jumping, I'm jumping real quick for the timeline here to be very respectful of our time. 1848, we got the Mexican-American War. Um, and from there, we have what is now known as the states of California, Nevada, Utah, et cetera. And in 1830, a man by the name of Rafael Rivera came into the picture. And he was a scout for the trading party of Antonio Arujo. And he is the one who actually named Las Vegas. He saw uh, Las Vegas Springs, what we have today as Springs Preserve and identified this as an outpost on route to California. 
Moving through the 1800s, we had a rising mining and railroading industry here in, Los, in the southwest Las Vegas region. And so um, majority Mexican and Chilean communities actually started coming here to work in those industries. Moving into the 1910s and 1920s, you saw the rise of the Mexican uh, Revolution, and that resulted in even more members of the Mexican community coming, and arguably returning home because it used to be Mexico. Um, going into the 1920s and 30s, you saw a rising pattern of chain migration. So you had families rejoining other family members that were here and starting their foothold of the Mexican community here in the Southwest region and Las Vegas. In 1942, you had the Bracero program, which actually was, um, which was instated by the US to, as an agreement with Mexico to allow members of the Mexican community to come to the US to support the agricultural industry, which had a labor shortage due to World War II. Um, during this time, you had also, looking, at, looking back at their oral histories, um, Judge Joe Mendoza's family actually came during that time, as well as the father of um, Isaac Barron, which is current, who's ser currently serving on the North Las Vegas Council Board. Moving on, fast forward track to the 1950s, you have a, a rise in hospitality industry, as well as the settlement of the Nellis Air Force Base. Um, which attracted even more members of the Mexican community and workers here in Las Vegas. The 1960s, an even greater growth in the hospitality industry, and that's when we finally start to see a real foothold in the east side of Las Vegas with the Latinx community, primarily with the Cuban population, because this coincided with the rise of the Castro regime. And so many, um, from looking back at the oral histories with the members of the Cuban community, they talked about Las Vegas being very similar to Havana. And so many members wanting to stay in touch with those hospitality and the casino industry came to Las Vegas to continue that uh, tradition and that industry. Moving on to uh, the 1960s, uh, through there you have the rise of the Circulo Cubano, so you had a rise in the Cuban community here as well. And moving into 1971, you had the founding of what is now the Latin Chamber of Commerce. All of this happening in the east side and center of Las Vegas. And so you had a rise of support in minority uh, community enterprises and entrepreneurship as well. Through the 80s and 90s, um, there was a rise of civil unrest through Central America, which led to um, Salvadoran communities, uh, Guatemalan, um, and all of those other um, um, areas dealing with civil wars during this time coming to Las Vegas as well to seek, um, to seek economic and uh, better of what they would call the American dream at the time. And so this also fostered a culture of immigration and that similar chain migration that I mentioned earlier as well. And here is where you actually have the east side setting the footholds of what is now the predominant Mexican, Cuban, and Salvadoran communities you see today. And so you had businesses rising like El Mundo Newspaper, El Rancho, um, which was a Mexican movie theater. You also had Plaza Escobedo, founded by Eddie Escobedo, who also found the El Mundo Newspaper, to create a sense of belonging in this area for Latinx businesses. And it's what's led to now you being able to go into these spaces on the east side and see only Spanish signs and only speak Spanish in these areas, um, making it even more welcoming to, to folk. Um, however, it also led to, not led to, but during this time there was also the rise of Latinx gangs in the area. So you had the notorious 28th Street Gang as well as El Locos Gang um, in the area. Um, and this created a, a sort of, um, what's, how would you phrase it? A, an ambiance and a, it sort of left a mark on the east side um, and continues to this day. And it's, it's interesting to see how it is that people are navigating through that and also combating these narratives of this dangerous side of the east side, despite um, this history that it has. Um, so through the 90s and through the early 2000s, you had a grow, continued exponential growth of the Latinx community, um, which has led to so many, um, so many members of the CCSD community and the student population being ESL primarily in the area with more than about 50% of them identifying as Spanish speakers. 
Um, so that's a general gist of what the east side is and how we got there. And yeah. Thank you so much. And you mentioned uh, Rafael Rivera. Yes. And so now the revitalization plan for the east side goes by that name. And I would just love to start the conversation talking about that revitalization plan. So this culturally, richly diverse area. So you want to start? Yes, please go ahead. So around the 2014 timeframe, um, the city started an effort that was a walkable community study and, that, and a focus area. It's a smaller focus area of within Ward 3, when the city's Ward 3. Um, and for whatever reason, was shelved at the time, and the city's now used that as a launch, a launch pad, a springboard to revitalization efforts in this focus area. Um, it's bound by 95 to the north, Mojave Road to the east, Wangert Avenue to the south, and Bruce Street to the west. And so uh, this is a focus area that we've, uh, we've been working on. We just wrapped up our engagement efforts, uh, outreach efforts, which included grassroots engagements to residents and businesses in the community, as well as um, stakeholders, institutional stakeholders of all, of all backgrounds, uh, those in the public sector, those in the private sector, uh, small business leaders. We engaged leaders in community of faith to get feedback to help inform the development of this plan that we're currently working on. So right now the plan is in development stage. Um, we are also ho hoping to get uh, what's called a neighborhood revitalization strategy area designation from HUD. It's a special designation that gives us flexibility in, how, in our entitlement funds and how we can uh, uh, use entitlement, federal entitle entitlement funds in this area. So um, I'll refer to it, uh, it's currently referred to as a Rafael Rivera. Uh, it's not official, like completely tied to that. Um, what it really is is a neighborhood revitalization strategy area. So you'll hear, hear me refer to as the focus area or the study area that's um, currently underway. Again, smaller part of larger efforts that are going on in revitaliza revitalization efforts that are going on in Award 3. Thank you, Jose. So Sarah, could you add to that, talk about the library, any other things that we can already see? Yeah, so... I mean, this is exciting to hear the, the narrative of the East Las Vegas community. I, I grew up in that community where the library now sits, the East Las Vegas Library. Um, that's where we grew up, my family. Uh, I'm one of nine brothers and sisters. Before the library was there, the projects were there, and that's where we grew up. Um, in the 70s and the 80s, um, being a product of that neighborhood gives me a lot of pride to hear um, these projects. You know, it, they're, they're a long time coming. They're very needed. When the library came into the neighborhood, um, I know there was talks of other locations for this library to go because it was such a big investment. Um, they, you know, there was people that thought that that neighborhood or that community was not a good fit for the type of technology and the size this library was going to be, um, and all the more reason why we needed it. And I advocated for it from the beginning because we needed the technology in that area. I mean, there was a, there was a huge technology gap. Um, the library provides so much for the community. I mean, Wi-Fi alone is such a, a need in the area. You can't apply for a job without having online access. So all these new developments and all these new plans the city's providing uh, or, or talking about is very exciting for me. I, I grew up in that community. I, I live in that community now. We moved back after several years because it is that important to me. So I'm, I'm very excited about these projects. I love the library, and I love that maker space that it has. Yeah. I mean, we have a maker space here at UNLV, but that maker space is just amazing. Yes, it is. So Yvette, could you, going from there, let's talk about how we talk about Wi-Fi and all of that <laughs> and what this library means when it comes to technology technical, all kinds of innovations. Mm -hmm. So please talk about that and talk about how we didn't have that during COVID. What happened? Yeah, you know, I think um, as we can all, you know, attest to the challenges that we faced when we um, had to transition, you know, a lot of different spaces to online instruct instruction. Uh, we saw a lot of our Clark County School District children, right, and families, you know, facing a lot of barriers as to, you know, well, what do we do now, right? And do we have access um, to, to Wi-Fi, right? To connection in order for our children to continue their education. 
Um, and I think, you know, initially, you know, the idea was, well, this is the way to go. Let's go ahead and do that, right? But we, we, for, we, we didn't take into account that a lot of our folks don't have access, right? And so I think that having a library like this in this particular area of our community um, allows, right, for that accessibility for a lot of our young people, a lot of our families. But not only that, it also offers a safe space, right, for them to be able to, to congregate, to learn, right, and also to bring in the rest of their community and family. Um, and, it's, and it's a space that folks can relate and feel comfortable, right, and be able to, and it also serves, serves as a hub, right, for any additional resources that, that they might need. the inequities that we began to see during COVID. Let's also stay on that topic for a moment. And, and please, all of you just jump in and talk about this. I want to talk about how the East Side community that community suffered more than any other communities in Clark County. And there are reasons for it. You can talk about employment, talk about medical care, talk about mental health, any of those areas. So anyone who is comfortable to jump in, Yvette will just take over if you don't just jump in, because these are things that were so profoundly felt in our city during this time. I, I agree. One of the things COVID did is that it exposed our weaknesses. It exposed everything that we didn't have. It exposed the gaps even more so. So in our community, in the, in the Hispanic community, um, one of the things that virtual learning did was those kids that didn't have access to internet or, or that had the ability to have someone at home kind of homeschool them, right? So one of the things that, um, that also affected was that our, our Fathers and mothers were essential workers. They needed to go to work and they needed to be able to provide food. And, and I mean, it was a scary time, but the students suffered a lot. Our students suffered a lot because of the technology gap and because there was nobody at home that could help them. If there was somebody at home that could help them with the work. You know, I remember being a child. And, I mean, there's no way I could ask my mom or dad to help me with homework because they didn't know the language. So that was one of the disparities that I saw the most in, in the Hispanic community is the ability to access or have support for our students uh, in education. And that's elementary through high school. Um, that was one of the biggest things that I felt was kind of very impactful. And we, we're still seeing the, the results of those impacts. So how do we remedy this? How are we, how does this new plan remedy this? So along those lines, one of the, uh, in terms of our focus area, the, the data tells us that this population, this focus area, uh, are highly are highly employed in the service industry. So they were disproportionately impacted, so many. And a lot of uh, what we're hearing from the community, too, is that access to specialty care. And 40% um, of this, this population does not own a vehicle. So it's very important that we have services and businesses and specialized care that's accessible, not just in one part of the city. So that's uh, one of the things that we're discussing uh, with in terms of the plan is looking at these impact areas and creating a plan that will encompass these, these things that we are, we're hearing back from the community. A lot of it is also trust building within the community that we've been working on in terms of our engage engagement efforts and that's still ongoing. So I wanna continue this, but I wanna know how you conducted those surveys in the community to gather all of this initial information? Sure, so we uh, conducted grassroots uh, engagement, uh, knocking on doors. So we knocked on the, uh, within the focus areas, we knocked on, all, on residents' doors and actually implement, uh, delivered hand surveys that, that we collected. Uh, we gathered over 500 responses from surveys for, from both the uh, residents and the business community. Wow. Yep. Amazing. And, the, and I can also add to that that the top three um, concerns from both the business community and the resident community was uh, homelessness, public safety, and beautification. Okay. Those are the top three needs that we're hearing back from the community. Good. And we want to talk about all three of those. Seraphim, you were about to say something. No, um, it was, you know, good old-fashioned canvassing, you know, door to door. I mean, sometimes 
you know, I, I've, been, I've been in meetings where you know, somebody will send out a flyer or an online notice on their website. And I mean, a lot of our communities don't, don't access websites. So if, if you think you're gonna reach a population in our community like that, it's, it's not gonna happen. You know, the, the, the percentage of people that are gonna receive that messaging is not likely to actually even be, you know, something you can record. So good old, you know, grassroots canvassing, knocking on doors, talking to people at places where they gather. That's how you get the information out. So, so some of those, one of those three things that you talked about is beautification. I, I want you to go deeper into that. Talk about parking, cars, talk about all of that and how it influences the community and how that has to change. Well, one of the things that we heard from the community with feedback is that there's a lot of pride with uh, cultural pride. And there's a lot of cultural assets in the community and there's that sense of pride. So um, people are very proud of their community and, and what it can offer. So um, definitely it's beautification comes up in terms of let's have cleaner sidewalks, let's have cleaner streets, let's have safer streets. Lighting and infrastructure is a concern as well. So um, as far as parking, I don't have data that's, I've, I've not read data that says anything about parking enforcements in relation to this area specifically. I know just in the downtown area parkings, uh, people will maybe have uh, opinions on parking and enforcement in that regard. It's typically uh, related to safety and access. So. And as far as parking, um, that happens to be an area that I'm very familiar with as well. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the beautification process of a neighborhood, of a community, um, of course, abandoned vehicles is a big issue. I mean, you could see in the region, Southern Nevada, in the areas where there isn't a parking program, you can see a vehicle that's abandoned for months and months and months. You know, and that is part of blight, that is part of beautification, that is part of pride in your community. You know, if, if, and then not to mention the safety concern, um, we see a lot more um, homeless individuals that are sleeping in cars in our communities, in, in our neighborhoods. And along with that, there's, there's, there's usually some drug use, some needles, dirty needles that are used and discarded left on the sidewalks, and when a kid is walking to school, um, I mean, you find a needle, I mean, I don't know why kids do what they do, but they'll, you know, play with them or have access to them. So all those things are associated to issues that need to be resolved with abandoned vehicles, and that's where the parking program com comes in. So I wanna talk about homelessness, mental health, and some of those uh, issues as well. So Yvette, could you jump in? Of course, um, as you mentioned, I'm a licensed social worker. I'm also pursuing my clinical internship at the moment um, to become a licensed clinical social worker. And that was not quite part of my trajectory um, in becoming a clinician. Um, but in recent years, because I have seen the need of more bilingual speaking um, clinicians and therapists in our community, um, I decided to pursue this route. And um, over the last couple of years, I've been working very closely with a lot of families um, that uh, face several mental health challenges. And, and let me say that, you know, if, you know, it's not just the East, you know, in the East Las Vegas community. I mean, it's, it's everywhere right now. And, um, and especially because of COVID, right? You know, I, you mentioned the challenges that a lot of our K through 12 students uh, and families, right, face during, um, you know, their transition to, to a learning online instruction. But we also saw that within this space, you know, of higher education. And as a lecturer here at the Unaldi School of Social Work, um, I was also able to experience and hear, right, a lot of those challenges and how that all impacted mental health. Right. And so we, you know, we, we see a huge disparity. We continue right, to experience a disparity um, in access to resources to, to this particular community. A lot of it has to do because of language barriers, uh, again, access to professionals um, that speak the language, that is able to you know, relate um, to those individuals and families and children. Uh, we also see a lack of professionals in the field, um, and then there's continues the stigma, right, of, of mental health. Folks just don't go and, and, and go talk to a therapist. 
um, a lot of our, um, our, our community, our gente, nuestra gente, you know, will first go to their church or their church leaders, right, to seek the, the help that they might need. And so, which is, which is great. Um, but they also, you know, but we also need to do a better job at um, disseminating, right, information about what is available to them, right, and how to navigate a lot of the resources that are available, you know, to them. I have families that come to, to sessions and, um, and a lot of families that are, come from traditional families so that seeking therapy, mental health is, is, is number one, not talked about. Um, and so they're there because they realize that, you know what, we can't do this alone anymore, right? And, and that's, that's a huge step. And I wish that we could continue to um, expand that message to all of our communities um, that, you know, that, that it's important to seek that help. And, um, but we also need to do our part, right, as, as a community, as a state, to be able to, again, provide, right, the resources. Um, and, and one thing I want to add is, you know, a lot of the times we, you know, we might talk about, right, uh, these individuals and families that are facing these challenges. But what I also picked up from our conversation so far is that we need to talk to them. Right? We need to involve them in these conversations as well. And, and what I'm gathering is that I think a lot of these efforts that are happening right now is involving our, our community members. Right, I see the pivot happening. Did you want to add anything, Natalie, to anything that you've heard so far, please? Yes. Um, so I think it in, to add to, to what you're saying, it's an, that sense of awareness is also super important about where these communities are coming from. Um, in the oral histories, I'm thinking immediately to um, Lynette Sawyer, who was an educator um, here in CCSD for, an, for a number of years and launched the um, Hispanic Museum, which um, unfortunately we don't have anymore. Um, but she, in her interview, she talked about a lack of cultural competency from administrators, from professionals in the district with students. So this created a, a Dis a disjunction. There's a lack of a bridge there because there's no understanding of that trauma that comes from families as well coming from these countries in Latin America and that Latinx diaspora. So during like the COVID-19 pandemic, um, you, there's a distrust, distrust with, the, with institutions, with political systems, with medical systems even. So that's why there was um, lower vaccination rates in these communities as well. And so um, thinking about all of these different histories of these communities and what trauma they're bringing with them and that intergenerational trauma that occurs therein is extremely important when starting these conversations mm -hmm. to really tackle the, tackle the, the issue therein and in informing because I know that during the pandemic, I was aware of all the WhatsApp conversations about all the different things that uh, were in the vaccine as well as just disinformation. Mm -hmm. And so um, bringing uh, the information forth therein and really um, starting that relationship with folks and being very transparent about intentions and values is ext extremely important to tackle these inequities. Great. We, we were on a university campus mm -hmm. and I wanna talk about education just some more. Mm -hmm. When it comes to earning bachelor's degrees, one of the groups at the bottom of the, the poll, the totem poll, when it comes to earning those degrees, we find it in the Latinx community. I wanna talk about education. This university is one of the minority serving, one of the most uh, well-known minority serving institutions in the country. So what, what are we missing? Why don't we have more students from the east side community, from North Las Vegas, coming to school here. What, what are we missing? How long do we have? Yeah. <laughs> um, that's the real question here. Um, yes. You know, again, I don't have the, the answer or answers, right, you know, to this, but I can base it off of just my personal experience. Um, I have all of my three degrees from UNLV. Uh, I've been in the state of Nevada for 21 years. 
graduated, first generation, graduated from Clark High School, and then immediately went uh, and started here at UNLV, and now I, I'm a faculty member here at UNLV, so very proud rebel. And, um, but getting here was, was definitely not easy. You know, the first challenge that comes to mind is affordability. Right, and being an aware, being aware of the financial uh, opportunities that exist, right, for for people that look like me, and um, and so that was one of my biggest challenges was trying to navigate, right, these the various systems, but in particular, right, how am I going to be able to afford, right, higher education. Higher education is also not always an option, right, for a lot of our um, members of the community. And so we, we, we have to also think about, you know, when we're, when we're talking to our young people, which I do a lot of work with young people, is well, what are some other career paths, right, that, um, that will also afford them a, a, a bright, you know, and successful, you know, future for themselves and their families. Um, so affordability, right, is one thing that comes to mind. Um, you know, secondly, you know, being able to offer the spaces, you know, for our students to, to be able to identify, right, with one another. Um, as I mentioned, when I first stepped foot here at UNLV, it was very difficult for me to find a professor, instructor that looked like me, that had a similar last name as me. Well, not quite. That was a little bit not common, but, um, and so that was, that was a huge challenge to the point where I didn't think I was going to continue uh, and, and graduate with my bachelor's. Um, but I've seen over the course of many, many years, you know, how UNLV has improved those efforts through a lot of diversity initiatives, through the MSI and the, you know, Hispanic Serving Institution designation um, to be able to afford those opportunities to our student population, but also to our staff and faculty. Um, but, but we talk about those kinds of things and we forget sometimes that the community that she talked about that started, especially in the 60s, that a leadership program was started here in the Latinx community. Anyone, talk about that and how significant it is today and has been for many, many years now. Natalie, can I join in this? Yes, yes. Um, so the Latino Youth Leadership Conference um, started in 1993 under the auspices of the Latin Chamber of Commerce. And uh, the, their education committee at the time, led by community leaders and, pi and Latino uh, pioneers, Tom Rodriguez, Dr. Maria Chaires, um, and also our very own Dr. Magdalena Martinez, which I know she was here with us earlier. Um, they started this program in an effort to increase um, Latinx students to pursue higher education as well as decrease um, dropout rates, high school dropout rates. And um, I'm happy to, to share that I was a participant of that program in 2002. And after that, I became a facilitator. I then became the program director all because of the support of entities like the Latin Chamber of Commerce, um, Otto Merida, Victoria Napolis, who continue to be my mentors. And we continued the program. It, it, it has evolved. I mean, it's been in existence for over 28 years. Um, I know Natalie participated in the program in 2015. And we have so many students that uh, currently attend UNLV that attended the program. And it's been such a success in the sense that it is a, a program that is now led by alumni, by young people, um, that is directed by adult facilitators, um, but with the intention to continue, right, to encourage our, our students to pursue not only higher education, but a variety of different career paths. And so that's a program that, um, you know, is, is part of, of a solution. Yes, right? exactly. Natalie, can you talk about the day-to-day -day activities of that program? Oh, yeah. Um, so um, 
I'm currently serving in that board that's helping make this uh, program happen this coming July. Um, applications are still open. If there's any <laughs> juniors or seniors out there that still want to apply, mm -hmm. please, we welcome your application. Um, and so the day to day is we're focusing, we have central themes for each of the, the, the six day, five night conference that we have here at UNLV. We house the students here in the dorms. Um, and as Yvette mentioned, this is all alumni organized, completely volunteer basis because we know that it was such an impactful experience for us. And we wanna make sure we continue supporting our Latinx youth here in Las Vegas um, and greater Southern Nevada. We've had people from, uh, mm -hmm. from other parts of Southern Nevada come here for this program because they know it's such a success. Um, but we have themes um, for each of the days based on community, leadership, higher education, we even have folks come uh, talk about financial aid and what that means. What's a subsidized, what's an unsubsidized loan? So we try to our best to inform um, our high school students about these, um, so what they would see as barriers to higher education, just to make sure they are aware of and informed about different ways they can access these resources and um, get that degree or go to trade school um, and see another path for them after graduation from high school. Um, and one of the great aspects of it is that cultural element um, and that cultural community. Um, and one of my best friends is from my familia because we put, we put mm -hmm. folks in familia. So my mm -hmm. best friend today is still, he was my brother in, in my family and uh, okay. we've made some great memories. Wonderful. So I don't want to forget the other uh, issue in the community and that's homelessness. We didn't talk about that yet. I hate to jump from something as positive as that leadership conference to go back to homelessness, but we cannot allow this panel to end without it. What has happened? Tell me about the joblessness and is that the unemployment? Is, is that fueling this? So what is happening with housing? And as we talk about revitalization, where are we going with the housing? Well, in our focus area, it's important to know that the average, the household median income is around 25,000 for this focus area. And this is all pre-pandemic. So when we talk about the current state of pandemic and where we're at in the housing crisis, um, it's not even just this area, necessarily the east side, yeah. but we know that this uh, area, area is very susceptible, very vulnerable to shifts. And, and when your rent changes so drastically from one month or a few months to the next, it definitely can affect any fa um, family. But one of the things uh, that we're working on in the plan is addressing um, economic, upward economic mobility and to help provide uh, more opportunities for job training, skills, um, entrepreneurship. A lot, of our, uh, a lot of the community members have skills where they're maybe doing an informal business and we wanna help navigate them to create that, turn that into a formal business and, and those opportunities. But in terms of homelessness, it's, it's the housing situation makes it even more uh, danger, dangerous at this time for those individuals. Okay. So on the on the homeless topic, I mean that's definitely something that, that everybody sees in the news now, the affordability of the homeless program. Yeah. So those are our new our, our recent um, families and individuals that are entering homelessness, but you still have the chronic homeless that have been there for 10, 15, 20 years. And a lot of that um, that we see, you know, I, I that's one of the areas I work in for as far as part of my job in North Las Vegas, but um, one of the things that we see is that we, we focus uh, a lot of effort and money on addressing homelessness as a, as a symptom of something greater, right? So I'd love to see more efforts put into prevention because, uh, and then it, it all ties together, education and opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when a population has barriers and they don't know how to overcome barriers, um, you know, it becomes a generational issue. You know, poverty is generational, drug abuse, gang, gang uh, participation is generational. If we don't start addressing prevention strategies to prevent these things, um, the barriers are gonna continue to stack up. And it is, it is a community's responsibility. And when I say community, I, I don't just mean local government or educators or schools or, it's everybody's best interest, mm -hmm. you know, to, to tackle these responsibilities that are a community issue, it should be a community solution you know, more prevention. Let's focus on um, breaking some of those barriers and replacing them with opportunities, you know, and everybody can participate in that. Right. One of the things, if I just could add, 
One of the things that I am so, so like, that excites me more than anything else is the youth. You know, last couple of years we've seen on TV worldwide, those that are making policy changes in the world, not just in our country, are, are the youth, you know, the young adults, yes. you know, and, and it just, it gives me such hope for the future because if anybody's going to be able to make these changes that are necessary, it's going to be you. And I think it's important that you realize how important it is for you to be socially responsible, getting involved, civically engaged, so that you can impact policy and impact the legislative changes that need to happen. Just because policies exist for 20, 30, 40, 50 years doesn't mean that they can't be changed. You know, we need to adapt them with time, and that will help us address on the prevention side. So we're not addressing the issues on the, on the chronic side of the system. And, and if I could just say, you guys out there that are here at UNLV, that are studying, that are out listening, you have so much more power than you realize. You can impact change in a way that I can't even impact change anymore in my old age. So I just <laughs> wanted to share that. All right. Um, and talking about impacting change and change coming from within the community, we've had some violence in, the, in CCSD recently. And there is a pastor in the East Side neighborhood who mm -hmm. has started a program called Dads in School. Mm -hmm. And if anyone knows anything about Pastor uh, Troy Martinez and what he is doing, I'd like for you to just talk about that and, and where that program can go. And do we need more parents in schools like this? Is this the way, one of the ways to go? You know, I think doing something is better than doing nothing. I can't criticize uh, Pastor Martinez. I mean, he's always been involved. He gets right in the middle of the danger, right? Uh, he's been known to you know, mitigate peace treaties between gangs and all kinds of innovative things that most people won't even want to tackle. So what he's doing and what that group of people that are doing, I hear there's a waiting list to, to get it to be a part of that. So I'm, yes. I'm really happy to hear that. Good. Any other comments on that? I will say that yes. I mean, we need a lot more parental engagement, um, but we also need uh, the, the available opportunities to be there, right, in order for them to be uh, able to be engaged. And so I think this is a great, great effort, a great start. Um, and I just want to piggyback off of what was mentioned already. You know, this, this is what we're doing here today. This is for you, for all the young people out there that are listening, that are here, right? When I'm in the classroom uh, and I get to uh, witness the Im immense um, dedication and motivation of our students that want to change our community for the better, um, it, I can say we, we do have a bright future ahead. Um, and, I, and, and I also want to continue to encourage you all to be a part of those conversations and spaces um, because you do have that power. Um, and like Cesar Chavez said, right? Si se puede. So we're gonna shift right now and we're gonna go to audience questions. Some of you have sent questions in by email, so we're gonna address those as well. Uh, we have some people who will be in the aisles with a microphone to have you pose your questions live to our audience. Oh, wonderful, right here. Uh, we can't see well enough when you, okay, good, thank you. <laughs> yes. history student here at uh, UNLV and I was raised on the east side and I went to a predominantly Hispanic high school it was Del Sol Academy and um, I'm I can pretty confidently say that most of the students there would have never recognized that the east side had like such a long Latinx history um, obviously it's easy to recognize that there's like a Latinx community here in Las Vegas and they of course have history here but I would have never thought it was something specific to the east side um, and I wish there was, I mean, the CCSC has so many things to work on, but I wish in schools there was like more, um, this was more emphasized and that more students would be aware of this. And um, I know there were a lot of immigrants at my high school and um, they, I was a tutor in a class one time and um, I felt kind of helpless be or useless because um, they didn't want to learn, like, um, because uh, I guess like they weren't receiving good accommodations and, um, 
uh, yeah, the education just wasn't really helping them. Anyway, and so I just wanted, I was curious, like, if you guys know if there's, like, a project or anyone working on anything to, um, like, encourage more awareness of this history in the East Side. So I think that we maybe have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I was about to ask for the mic. I forgot. <laughs> um, uh, so actually one of the former members of uh, the Latinx Voices Oral History Project and a very proud East Sider, um, Lawrence Banuelos Benitez, he is now um, a teacher in the district. Um, I'm not entirely sure of what high school. It's Rancho. Rancho. Um, and he's actually brought the oral histories that we collected in the project to his classroom and he's sharing that with his high school students. Um, I'm not sure if there's a wider project like that happening in our in CCSD, but I do know we, that those initiatives are starting. Um, and it starts with one, and the hope is that he'll um, build that network so we can have a, a greater program that really connects students to connect with their own community um, and really uh, combat the narratives that you do see uh, that are affiliated with the East Side and then other parts of Las Vegas as well. And because we have some teachers now at Rancho High School, they are doing an oral history project of the community surrounding the school and the families of some of the kids. So we have over 700 kids who will be collecting information and history about the city over the next few weeks. We train them here in the Oral History Research Center. So yes, some of that is starting to happen. And thank you. In the process of starting some engagement work specifically around that uh, where we're going to invite the community to share their memories their pictures or artifacts so that we can tell more of the the, east, the story of the east side uh, we actually were um, and it was announced that we are the recipients of a grant through the national park service for this area it's a, a historical context uh, survey we will do a recognizance level survey of this focus area to determine if there's any um, structures that meet national standards for historical preservation and, and historical registry. So there will be more conversations along those lines of, of capturing those and telling those stories. Wonderful, That's amazing. Um, I think I see another hand here, yes. Hi, um, my name's Daniela. I'm a uh, graduate student for the communications department. Um, and this is probably a little less of a question and more of a, my little nugget of trying to advocate for something. Um, so I have three younger siblings. All three of them are um, avid participants in CCSD's like mariachi program. Mm -hmm. And they have started since sixth grade. I have a sibling who graduated high school. And um, all years from sixth grade up until senior year participated in mariachi and so are my two younger siblings. And one of the things that I have found is many mariachi students feel the sense of graduating and not having an opportunity to continue to practice their craft. Mm -hmm. And I think even thinking about like UNLV or like uh, CSN, having that um, avenue to continue to practice that, there's a lot of need for that. Um, I say that because my brother has tried to like gather students who have graduated to even, you know, perform as a group. And right before COVID, they were getting like Instagram messages to like participate in events and stuff. COVID happened and then that completely fell off. <laughs> but I think there's a lot of room to continue to like nourish perhaps mm -hmm. um, that talent that is very unfortunate. Students graduate and it kind of stops. Um, so I kind of just wanted to put that out there. Um, and hopefully in terms of community engagement, I feel like that's a, that's a field that could really use some love. Yeah, thank you for that. That's something I, I will look into a little bit further because that would be an awesome uh, opportunity to uh, elevate those musicians into uh, you know, secondary education programs as well. Because that is something that um, I mean, I hear mariachi music and I feel like crying. I don't drink, but I feel like taking a shot of tequila or something, right? But, because it is so culturally tied to our yes, roots. Absolutely. Loves it. Everyone yeah. is here for it. They yes. It Thank you. And maybe we oh. should talk to some of our departments here on campus, fine arts, mm -hmm. or 
you know, maybe we should start that conversation. Absolutely, and uh, another suggestion, you know, with the Latino Youth Leadership Conference, after a few years we but again, we, were, we, we had a lot of students that were enrolling at UNLV and other institutions across the state. Um, and, and we formed the Latino Youth Leadership Alumni. I serve as their, their advisor. And, um, and so another suggestion would be maybe, you know, if your brothers come here or a brother or, you know, someone else that's part of that, you know, a musician that's part of that program or was part of the program, maybe they can start a student organization right and start to kind of get some fillers and you know some folks interested and 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 then i think with the connection with the fine arts with the department of fine arts mm -hmm. yeah could be a start i i see a hand i see two hands in the back sorry um uh, i well, originally i wasn't going to ask this but i second everything that you just said because um my both my sisters were also in mariachi and like got really good at it and then kind of just like you said like fell off after um high school and i was in flocorico i opted out of mariachi i didn't want to play an instrument but same thing like it really um brought me closer to like being mexican um so i also agree that it's a very big thing that could help a lot is like bringing that out and making it um putting more emphasis on it. I remember one of my favorite memories in middle school was we had Mexican instructors come and teach us Flocorico. We had like a whole conference and we performed at the Smith Center. So it was really just a great memory. Um, but my, my, my question um, had to do with community engagement. And I know we talked about like beautification projects that um, are kind of like in, in the works. So I'm curious, as I'm very interested in like volunteer service. And so I want to know uh, what programs are currently like taking place, and um, as far as like like park cleanups or uh, street cleanups, I know that's like something that um, needs to take place. So I was curious, what system is in place to get involved? Like how is um, like an, who to reach out to and things like this to get involved? Whether it be North Las Vegas or Las Vegas, but participating in those volunteer service projects. Well, I'm, I'm gonna share something real quick. So. <clears throat> I live in the east side in the city of Las Vegas in Ward 3, but I work for North Las Vegas. So in, in, in we're downtown North Las Vegas. So my heart is like, there is no jurisdiction in my love for my, my people, mi raza. You know, there is no jurisdictional boundary, right? So <clears throat> a lot of the people that we serve are, are Hispanic and are Latino. And one of the parts that's so important in helping and educating and helping this community grow is... Um, social responsibility, which to me means volunteerism, right? So we're, we're starting a volunteer program in North Las Vegas, um, not just for employees, but also for the community to be able to get involved because we understand the importance of somebody learning how, to, how this community functions, how this country works, how we get involved in our community. It starts with social responsibility, which means we volunteer, we participate. We, we pick up the trash that somebody left on our sidewalks because it's where we live. We should have that, you know, that pride of where we live. And sometimes when we come from other countries, um, we, don't, we don't have that, or we feel that this is in our country, so this is in my responsibility. When it, in, in fact, if we're living here, whether we rent or we own, this is where we live. We should take pride in that. So volunteerism is a very important part of that progression, that growth, the, the, the ability to accelerate a generation or a group of people into um, after social responsibility to civic engagement and then to participating in policy changes and things like that, that's where it starts. So we're focusing on that and that's very, very important for us. So I don't know, Jose. Uh, yeah, I'll add to that. In terms of our revitalization efforts, um, there is a component, there will be a pillar or impact area, I should say, uh, that speaks specifically to arts and culture. So we actually engaged local artists and, and got feedback from them and talking about creating cultural hubs and spaces to celebrate culture. So there will be opportunities for just not only public art, but more of a celebration of the culture in the area. And so that's something to look uh, look for. You can find more area, um, sorry, more information on the City of Las Vegas webpage under uh, Governments Initiatives. Uh, Rafael Rivera Plan will talk more information. That's a good way to get connected to our newsletter as well. Um, in terms of just beautification, we do have adopt a spot program, and you can also find more information on the website to talk about existing programs. And we are working on strengthening our volunteer programs as well. Wonderful. I see several hands on this side of the room. 
And this is probably going to be the last question. <laughs> Hello. Um, thank you all. This is so marvelous, so encouraging, and I'm so grateful to be here to hear this. Um, the arts have always led in the transitions that come in our communities, and please follow that trail in the arts. I want to throw out the idea and the suggestion that uh, the energy transition that we are in right now needs to be represented in, in your communities, and I hope they're having that conversation in both the beautification and the revitalization. It's significant, and uh, there are opportunities out there uh, because 40% of the money is being allocated have to go to underserved communities. People want ideas. People want to understand what you're looking for. Tell us what you're looking for. Um, I just received a, a grant from the Nevada Arts Council to uh, work out the, at the left of Center Art Gallery in North Las Vegas uh, to have seven workshops with the Nesby Junior Organization, National Society for Black Engineers Juniors, and we're going to talk about poetry elements, and public speaking about renewable energy and the climate change. Arts can lead the transition. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we're about out of time. Uh, do I have time for one more question? We have time for one more question. Sorry to everybody else who didn't get to ask. <laughs> Uh, you brought up, uh, I forgot your name, but... Uh, Jose. Councilman? Jose? Jose? Yeah. Sorry. No. Jose, you brought, up the, you brought up the importance of the uh, East Las Vegas Library and being able to, like, access resources. And I just wanted to ask about, like, uh, specifically to the two councilmen, are there any future projects that are specific to fiscal uh, infrastructure investments, such as a library or a park, that will help people? Because uh, a lot of people brought up the need for social spaces to feel comfortable in, the need for cult uh, places to hold cultural events, to hold uh, jobs training centers, and for other education and informational services. Like if there was a, 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 a specific physical space that could be built, uh, are there any future projects for that space to be built and uh, how much uh, community uh, feedback is gonna be uh, given to like uh, shape how that looks or how that uh, pans out? Are there any specific plans? That is what I'm asking. So, um, first of all, you just promoted me to councilman. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, I'm not a council person by any means, but, but thank you. Um, to answer your question, everything you just described um, was created into uh, the East Las Vegas Library. So libraries today aren't what they used to be, right? Yeah. They were just books, a bunch of encyclopedias and all <laughs> kinds of stuff. East Las Vegas Library now, we actually did a podcast from there on a, a weekly basis for about a year. Um, it was a Kickback 702 podcast that we were doing out of the East Las Vegas Library. They also have a recording studio, like top-notch uh, uh, technology. So if anybody has an opportunity to go to the, to go to the um, library, check it out. But that also was designed with the intention of having cultural events. So they have a, a cultural center where you can provide, um, you can seat up to 300 people. So there's a lot going on in that library right now. But what you're describing, I think, um, is, 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 I don't know if there's plans in the future for more places like what he described that, that you might be able to talk about. Um, not in terms of a library, but I can tell you in terms of infrastructure projects, we have about 29, roughly 29 infrastructure, infrastructure projects slated for um, within the focus area and the greater Ward 3. So it's a lot of work that's being done, a lot of investment that's being made. Um, you mentioned community engagement. We're certainly going to have community engagement efforts around this uh, neighborhood revitalization strategy area. But if that's the one message and takeaway I can give is just to get involved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Follow us, interact with us on our social media platforms, on our website, sign up to our newsletter, because that's the most critical piece is getting the community uh, educated, informed, and involved. Wonderful. So I'd like to thank our panelists, Yvette Avalda, uh, Jose Contreras, Seraphin Calvo, Natalie Martinez. Thank you so much. This was a wonderful conversation. So in closing, um, again, I want to thank our sponsors, UNLV University Libraries, the Greenspan College of Urban Affairs. I'd also like to think, thank UNLV TV for streaming these amazing conversations that we get to hold. 
If you'd like more information on this topic, other topics that we've talked about in the past, please visit www.library.unlv.edu backslash we need to talk. We have a number of videos and, and you'll find previous conversations and you're gonna find all kinds of resources, additional reading materials that go along with each of the conversations. I wanna thank you for this conversation today and I look forward to, in the fall, we're going to have more of these new topics that we're going to be discussing. So thank you so much.